So let's talk today about, well, the topic is ultimately going to be something called the Poincaré Bendixson Theorem. But on the way to discussing this, we're going to have to um, provide a fair number of other definitions and concepts. So, let's start by talking about stable and unstable manifolds of fixed points. So we've talked a lot about fixed points by now. Now we're going to use them to define some concepts and we'll start with stable manifolds. The stable manifold of a fixed point is all the values that's that's phrased this in two dimensional space although it generalizes fine to points in higher dimensional space but all of the values x0 comma y0 such that How do I want to phrase this? I might need to talk about the notation here, but the limit as t goes to infinity of x sub zero of t comma y sub zero of t equals the fixed point. And by using our mathematical notation and writing this as a limit, we're making this seem probably more complicated than it actually is. I mean, let's say we have a fixed point, and we have some other value over here. Well, we ask what happens to this other value as time passes. If you start here, what happens? And I mean, a lot of things could happen. Maybe you just sort of wander off to infinity, or maybe you wind up spiraling around some other asymptotically stable fixed point or whatever, but maybe as time passes, you converge to that fixed point over there. And if that's what happens, then you're in the stable manifold of the fixed point. 
So the stable manifold of the fixed point is all of the initial conditions that converge to the fixed point as time passes. Say, for example, that we've got a linear differential equation and the origin is a saddle. So we've got the Cartesian plane, we've got the origin, we've got an unstable and a stable, nope, that's two unstable eigenvectors I've drawn. We've got a stable eigenvector and an unstable eigenvector. So the origin is unstable. Saddle fixed points are unstable. Almost any initial condition in the plane will go away from the origin as time passes, but there are initial conditions that converge to the origin. If we are on this eigenvector, Then as time passes, we stay on the eigenvector and we converge towards the origin. So even though the origin is unstable, it does have a stable manifold. There's a line of points that converge towards it. Um, compare that or contrast that so what if lambda 1 and lambda 2 are both positive so the origin is an unstable node You've got the origin, the origin is a fixed point, every other value goes away from the origin in these parabolic curves. Well, this fixed point doesn't have a stable manifold. Or I guess if you want to be really technical, you can say that the fixed point itself is a one-point stable manifold. But every other... I'm going to help. I think the sun isn't shining. That got closed because it was blinding students. Let's open it. Um, anyway, back to this. Um, there's no stable manifold, or you could say that the origin is a one-point stable manifold, but every initial condition other than the origin goes away from the origin. So that's the idea of a stable manifold. An unstable manifold is similar, but maybe it's not what you would expect. If a stable manifold is the values that go towards the fixed point, the temptation is to think that the unstable manifold are the values that go away from the fixed point. And that's not correct. The unstable manifold is smaller than that most of the time. So,
So, to be on the unstable manifold, I'll just can't copy part of the definition. The limit as t goes to negative infinity. equals the fixed point. So to clarify what we mean by this, and to drive home the distinction between being on an unstable manifold versus just going away from the fixed point, Let's once again look at a saddle fixed point. So virtually every value on the Cartesian plane is going away from the origin as time passes. If you start anywhere except on the, uh, except on the stable manifold, except on the eigenvectors that are going towards the origin, then as time passes, you go away from the origin. Like, if you start here, then you go away from the origin. But you're not on the unstable manifold. And that's because as time goes to negative infinity, if you look at the past, you are also going away from the origin. So as time goes in the negative direction, you are not converging towards the origin. Now compare and contrast that if you're sitting on that eigenvector. If you're sitting on that eigenvector and we don't look at chaos and don't look at noise, you stay on the eigenvector forever. And as time passes, you go away from the fixed point. But as ta if time, if we look at the past, if we are here, where did we come from? Well, we came from the fixed point. If we let time go negative, then instead of going away from the fixed point, we go back towards the fixed point. So the saddle, even though Almost every value on the plane converges away from the origin. Its unstable manifold is relatively small. Its unstable manifold is just the values on that eigenvector. And Notice that um, there's a value in this saddle example. There's a value that's on both the stable and the unstable manifold, and that's the origin itself. I mean, the way we've defined this, um, if you start at the origin, if you start at the fixed point, then time goes to positive infinity, you stay on the fixed point. As time goes to negative infinity, you stay on the fixed point. So these stable and unstable manifolds intersect, but they intersect in a very kind of uninteresting way. They just intersect at one point. 
Stable and unstable manifolds can intersect less trivially and give you more interesting behavior. And to talk about that, we're going to introduce the topic of orbits. And before we get to what I was just saying, that um, we can have these stable and unstable manifolds intersect in kind of interesting ways, let's talk about a simpler kind of orbit. I mean, you hear the word orbit, you probably think of, you know, planets going around the sun or, you know, the moon going around the earth or whatever. In other words, if here's the sun, you think of planets tracing out these closed loops. And that's all a periodic orbit is. It's a closed loop. The word periodic comes from the idea, you know, the sine function is periodic. And that's because, you know, we start at time zero, the sine does its thing, and then after two pi time units, we're back where we started. And we just keep repeating the same graph segment over and over again. And that's precisely what's happening with these periodic orbits. You start wherever you start. You go either clockwise or counterclockwise. In this picture, I have us going counterclockwise. You go around the orbit. Maybe you sometimes slow down. Maybe you sometimes speed up, but you're not changing direction ever. And then you get back to where you started, and then you just keep repeating that over and over again. And although we didn't use this word, we have seen periodic orbits before. The picture that I have here is of a center. We've got a neutrally stable fixed point whose um, eigenvalues are purely imaginary. And in that case, trajectories near the fixed point orbit the fixed point forever in this way. We're never going in this class to learn about how to um, no, that's probably the wrong order to present the material in. Say that we can't find it before we say what it is. Um, a periodic orbit can be asymptotically stable or it can be unstable, just like a fixed point. So maybe we have this periodic orbit. Let's do a little erasing if we can. And if we start near the periodic orbit, maybe we find that as time passes, we converge towards the periodic orbit. You know, if we start here inside the periodic orbit. Again, maybe as time passes, we converge towards the periodic orbit. 
So a periodic orbit can have the same asymptotic stability properties that a fixed point can have, which is that maybe a nearby values converge to it. And that's good, because remember that in any real-world situation, the math may say we stay on a periodic orbit forever, but the reality is always going to be that we're being buffeted around by random noise that isn't accounted for in the model. So, you know, we saw these periodic orbits with the predator-prey models. Um, the Lotka Volterra predator-prey models, we saw periodic orbits, and we predicted that if we got kicked off, well, we predicted that neither species would go extinct, and they just kind of keep orbiting a fixed point. Well, what happens in reality when you get kicked off a fixed point? What happens when there's a harsh winter that isn't accounted for in the model? Well, it's okay, you can get kicked off the periodic orbit, but then as time passes, you just converge back. And similarly, I mean, of course, if you can have asymptotically stable periodic orbits, you could have unstable periodic orbits. Maybe if we get kicked off it, we spiral away from it or something like that. So periodic orbits can be asymptotically stable, or they can be unstable, or they can be neutrally stable. I, uh, I told kind of a lie when I was uh, insinuating that the Lotka Volterra periodic orbits were asymptotically stable. They're actually, I believe, neutrally stable. If you get kicked off one of these periodic orbits, you just get on to another periodic orbit, and you stay near the original periodic orbit, not moving far away from it. So as I was starting to say, uh, Periodic orbits, their stability, in one sense, is very similar to, uh, to finding the stability of fixed points. There's a technique you can use, Poincaré sections, where you find a matrix and you look at the eigenvalues of the matrix. But the details require a lot of sort of preparation that we have time to do. So we won't be finding the stability of periodic orbits here. We'll just be observing that they have stability, essentially. Now, there are two other orbits that can exist, essentially. There are two other orbit-like things that can happen. And these are both going to be discussed in terms of the stable and the unstable manifold. So, these are de being defined in terms of fixed points. Um, we can define a homoclinic orbit. So, um, 
I don't know about the clinic, but homo for same. The image here is that we start at the fixed point and then we end up at the fixed point. More formally, the idea here is that this is that we have a fixed point and it's stable and unstable manifolds intersect non-trivially. Let's draw a picture of this. We've got a fixed point, and we've got a value uh, by non-trivially. The, the fixed point is always there. So what I mean is that something's there other than the fixed point. So let's say this dot up here in the upper right is in both the stable and the unstable manifolds. What happens? Well, as time passes, it converges to the fixed point because it's in the unstable manifold. I mean, because it's in the stable manifold. If you let time go in reverse, this comes from the fixed point as well. If you let time go in reverse, we go back to the fixed point. So we've got a picture that looks like this. It looks basically like a periodic orbit, except instead of being centered around a fixed point, this is a periodic orbit that, that goes through the fixed point. And here's where this sort of stability stuff is important. Here's, I mean, it's important for a lot of reasons, but most immediately, this is why I pause to talk about this. Because if you're on the homoclinic orbit itself, being on a homoclinic orbit is nothing like being on a periodic orbit. Here's a homoclinic orbit. Here's a periodic orbit. If you're on the periodic orbit, let's use a different color. If you're on the periodic orbit, then as time passes, you go around and around forever. If you're on the homoclinic orbit, then as time passes, you just get closer and closer to the fixed point. You never pass the fixed point. You never make a complete revolution. You just converge towards it. Where these things are similar is the pictures we get if we have an asymptotically stable periodic orbit versus an asymptotically stable homoclinic orbit. So, if we have an asymptotically stable periodic orbit, and we start near it, we converge towards this periodic orbit, going around and around forever. If we have a homoclinic orbit that's asymptotically stable, and we start near it, we converge 
closer and closer to the homoclinic orbit, going around and around forever. So as long as we're not actually on the orbit itself, the pictures we're getting from the homoclinic versus the periodic orbits are very similar. And here's where, again, we sort of, we, we use the fact that, you know, there's going to be noise in real world situations. So we shrug and say, well, even if we started on the homoclinic orbit, or even if we started on the periodic orbit, we just get bounced off it due to noise. So we don't care that the trajectories on the orbit are mathematically predicted to behave differently. Because in the real world, we're not staying on those orbits. We're getting kicked off of them. And once we've ki we're kicked off of them, we're seeing the same picture, which is spiraling in if we start out here, or spiraling out towards the orbit if we start in there. I should say, by the way, this is, again, one of those things we're uh, not likely to have time to actually discuss. There are standard ways of adding random variables, adding random white noise to a model. Like, if you're on Wolfram, well, I don't know about Wolfram Alpha. If you're on Mathematica, or you're using R, or Python, or whatever, to study a differential equation, you can tell R, or Python, or Mathematica, adding a little randomness to this model. And it will do that for you. So I sort of talk about, I mean, talk about models not including noise, but models can include noise. It's just a little outside the scope of this class. So you've got periodic orbits and you've got homoclinic orbits. You can also have what we call heteroclinic orbits. Um, heteroclinic orbits require multiple fixed points. So maybe you have three fixed points. And heteroclinic orbits occur when the stable and unstable manifolds of the different fixed points intersect. Which, drawing a picture to clarify that, let's say you start near this fixed point, and um, you're in the unstable manifold of this fixed point, so as time goes to negative infinity, you would go back to this fixed point. Maybe you're in the stable manifold of this fixed point. That gives us a connection like that. If we start near one of the fixed points, we go off to the other fixed point. And then maybe, if we start near this fixed point, maybe this fixed point is in an unstable manifold. 
that intersects the stable manifold of the third fixed point. And then maybe we go from the third fixed point back to the first fixed point. And we get a flow diagram that looks like this. This is called a heteroclinic orbit, as I wrote on the board. And again, uh, it's important to sort of make, let me, uh, I think I kind of covered the fixed points up. Again, what happens if you are actually on the heteroclinic orbit? is very similar to what happens if you're actually on a homoclinic orbit, which is that you'll just converge to one of the fixed points as time passes. And you won't jump over it, and you won't make any complete loops. Again, we don't really care about what happens on the orbit. If we're on the orbit, white noise will just knock us right off it. So we care what happens near the orbit. And again, just like with homoclinic orbits, we can have an asymptotically stable heteroclinic orbit. And the picture we see is that we converge to this orbit, getting closer and closer. So we're spiraling in and we're going around forever. And that then is what a heteroclinic orbit looks like. Um, Heteroclinic orbits, I actually, actually used this in a paper once. Not a very good paper, in my opinion. It was one of those things I was talking about where we have like 12 inequalities and none of them seem to mean anything. But if, if they're all satisfied, something happens. Um, but, I mean, but the heteroclinic orbits get used in models where we want to have some idea of choice. Like we have various places we can be. And we want to sort of model the idea of starting in one of these locations and going to another location. And we can do that with these unstable manifolds and these sort of paths, right? We can model the idea of starting here and then going here, and we have the idea of starting there and then going there, and we have the idea of starting here and then going there. So when these show up in models, where it's usually because we are trying to, as I say, trying to think of um, sort of that choice. And I say the word choice because maybe we have a more complicated picture. Maybe this fixed point, maybe its unstable manifold intersects both the stable manifolds. So if we start near this fixed point, but in a different place, we can go right to that third fixed point without going near the second one. But the details aren't really uh, important to us, at least not they're not important to our stated goal, which was the Poincaré Bendixson theorem. 
For the Poincaré-Bendixson theorem, we need uh, we need a final definition. Has anyone here taken analysis with Mike Vogel yet? No? Taking algebra, probably. Analysis will be next semester. Let's see. How do I want to make this? I'll state this definition in a relatively formal, informal way. A region in the plane R2 is said to be a closed if it includes its bound. Values. So I'm talking about regions in the plane, but maybe the easiest way to first present this material is by looking at a number line. You can look at the interval from zero to three. And this interval has two boundary values. It's bounded by zero on one hand, on the left, and by three on the right. And if we remember what this parenthesis bracket notation means, we're including zero, but we're not including three. So there's a boundary value that is not included, and this interval is not closed. If we erase this open parenthesis and replace it with a closed bracket, now we are including the boundary, and the interval is closed. On the plane, we could look, here's a region that isn't closed. x squared plus y squared is less than 1. This region pretty ghastly circle, but this region is all of the points inside of the unit circle. It doesn't include the points on the circle, though. So we've got all of the points inside this circle, but the boundary the points on the circle aren't included. So it's not closed. Make that a less than or equal to. Now the boundary is included, and this region is closed. So, using lines and dots in a hopefully intuitive way, if we've got a region, and there are any vectors, um, boundary values on that region that aren't included, the region isn't closed. If all of the boundary values are included, the region is closed.
a region in R2 is bounded if we can draw a finite circle around it. Uh, there are other ways this could be phrased, but I hope this is pretty intuitive. Let's look at some graphs. Let's look at the region. Let's see where Yeah, that's not it. Here. Here's a region on the plane. And Desmos is very nicely using these uh, dashed values to tell us that something isn't being included. So this is not a closed region. If we made that a less than or equal to, and that a less than or equal to, it would become closed. No matter what these inequalities are doing, this is bounded. It's possible to draw a circle around it. So if we now uh, turn this back into a less than or equal to symbol, this region here is both closed and bounded. And I bring that up because we're going to give that a special name. A region that is both closed and bounded is called compact. One of the most important definitions in mathematics, although trying to get to that importance is sort of outside the scope of this class. Um, a lot of results that we saw in calculus that we phrase as being true about intervals are really statements about compact regions. Like in calculus, we have a theorem that if we have a continuous function on a closed interval, that function has an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum. That's really a theorem about compactness. And now you've taken calculus three and you've seen uh, multivariable functions. Um, that, in, that theorem generalizes to the statement that if we have a continuous function on a compact region of the plane, it has an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum. Just, just for example. 
But for our purposes, we're going to use compactness. Just again, we're all building towards this theorem, this Poincare Bendixson theorem. And we just need compactness because it's a word that's going to appear in the theorem when we state it. Lots of definitions just to get to one theorem. There's still another definition to go. A region in the plane R2 is called a trapping. region if initial conditions in the region Stay there. Um, so trapping region, uh, certainly more than compactness, is hopefully a pretty evocative phrase. We've got some region in the plane. What it means to be a trapping region is that if we start in this region, we're trapped here. We cannot do this. We cannot leave the region. If we start there, we're stuck there forever. Um, some textbooks will define a trapping region to be compact. So they'll say that to be a trapping region, it has to have this trapping property. If you start there, you have to stay there forever. And it has to be compact. Um, that's not universal. We'll just use the phrase compact trapping region. We have seen trapping regions before. Although, of course, we didn't use that phrase. Um, in particular, Trapping regions occurred when we looked at the Lotka Volterra competition model. So we have two species, X and Y, that are competing for the same resources. And I mean, I'm not expecting this to be in anyone's sort of memory, but the Lotka Volterra competition model assumes that even if we completely ignore competition, there are limits to how much each animal population can grow. So even if we have two animals 
and we're using this model, but they're not actually in the competition. Species X will only grow so big, and species Y will only grow so big. So there is a maximum value to how big species X can get. And there's a maximum value to how big species Y can get. And these maximum values are boundaries, right? If we start down here, our population can't go up there. It can't get over the maximum. So there's an upper bound there. Likewise, this maximum value for species X is a boundary. If we start here, species X can't get bigger than that maximum. So a trajectory like I just erased can't exist. So because we have these maximum values of x and these maximum values of y, and likewise, um, this is a boundary. Species Y can never have a uh, negative number of species. Species X can never have a negative number of species. And we therefore have this box. And if we start in the box, we have to stay there forever. Whatever we are doing, we cannot leave this box. So that's a trapping region. And the question that the Poincaré Bendixson theorem is seeking to answer is okay, so you're in this trapping region. We, again, this is not stuff you need to have committed to memory, but this competition, ah, did not mean to erase that. Let's get that drawn back in. Maybe a slightly better square than that. So there were fixed points in this model. Mutual extinction, coexistence, one of the animals drives the other extinct. Fixed points were actually up here. One of the animals drives the other extinct and then grows as big as it can. Or maybe species X drives species Y extinct and then grows as big as it can. So what the Poincaré-Bendixson theorem is trying to answer is Okay, suppose you know all of this. We got all of this without using any kind of computer software, just by looking at fixed points. What happens then if we start in this region? Do we go to a fixed point? Do we orbit a fixed point? Or do we see something really complicated? Maybe if we start in this trapping region, we're going to see really intricate, 
curves with, well, curves can't actually loop like I've drawn accidentally, but maybe we're seeing some kind of weird Brownian motion thing. And these trajectories are just completely indescribable. Well, the Poincaré-Bendixson theorem says, no, that can't happen. If you're in a compact trapping region, then the trajectories are going to be simple and easy to understand. So, we've got this situation where in the plane, these differential equations are autonomous. And let me say, I mean, we'll get to this more when we talk about chaos. It is important for the poincare bendixson theorem that we are in the plane, that we're in R2. A lot of this course, we've been in R2, but that was just kind of for simplicity, because I didn't want to find the eigenvalues of a 5 by 5 matrix. We just looked at 2 by 2 matrices. But for the poincare bendixson theorem, this is essential. The theorem is not true outside of R2. If an initial condition is in a compact trapping region, then what happens as time passes? Well, one of three things, or I could compact that down to one of two things, but let's say one of three. It could be a fixed point. Or it could be on an orbit. And when I say orbit, I am including periodic, homoclinic, and heteroclinic orbits. All three of those I'm calling orbits here. If it's not, if this initial condition isn't a fixed point, and this initial condition isn't on an orbit, there is only one other thing that can happen. It can converge to a fixed point or an orbit. And those are the only possibilities. So, the Lotka Volterra predator prey model. Coming back to this, we found that two of the fixed points were unstable. 
and two of the other fixed points were asymptotically stable. Um, so we can, I think this might be in the homework actually, I don't know, well, if it is, it is, I guess. We can um, deduce what's going to happen um, from any initial condition here. Um, I guess I guess I'm going to have to tell you that there are no um, homo or heteroclinic orbits. I don't quite know if there's any really obvious way to see that. Um, there are no periodic orbits because, and I think again, I think this is just stated in the homework. But periodic orbits can only be around neutral fixed points. If you've got a periodic orbit, there's a neutrally stable fixed point somewhere inside of it. And we don't have any neutrally stable fixed points here. So just using that information without any computer software, we can say what's going to happen more or less in this model. Where in a compact trapping region, we can't converge to a, period, to a periodic or any kind of orbit um, because there aren't any. If we start somewhere that isn't on a fixed point, Well, we're not on a fixed point, we're not in an orbit, so we converge to a fixed point. Um, we converge to a fixed point or an orbit, but there aren't any orbits. So, we converge to a fixed point, but we can't converge to an unstable fixed point, so we must be converging to one of the two asymptotically stable fixed points. So, the Poincaré Bendixson theorem, together with this picture, allows us to figure out what happens. It allows us to just look at this picture and say, okay, well, we must be converging to one of the two asymptotically stable fixed points. Both those asymptotically stable fixed points correspond to extinction of a species. So we predict that one of the species will drive the other species extinct. And that is the Poincaré-Bendixson theorem. And the Poincaré-Bendixson theorem is simultaneously very important and not as important as you would like. It's very important in the sense that it's a powerful tool for looking at equations on the plane. It's not as important as you, we would like because, as I already mentioned, it cannot be generalized. If we're in three-dimensional space, we can have trapping regions and we can see completely bizarre and chaotic behavior inside of those trapping regions. Where instead of converging to orbits, we converge to these kind of indescribable things that aren't orbits and aren't fixed points. And um, this, uh, the fact that this 
Poincaré Bendixson theorem fails catastrophically in in three dimensional space was um, one of the major results of oh I'm blanking on his name this is embarrassing but um, the guy who first named the butterfly effect. He was doing uh, models with more than two variables, and he was observing that even though he was working inside a trapping region, he was seeing these bizarre effects that couldn't be explained via the Poincaré Bendixson theorem. And we'll talk about that and show some pictures Thursday this week and I will see you then. And in, in spite of my predictions, every time I say that I think we're going to come short, we use basically the full class period.